Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are going to be talking today about what is happiness. It is a rather simple question, but it is one that is also rather complicated. It is a lot of people, in our estimation, we've talked about this at great length. Some people think they can find happiness by being good at a particular thing. Some people think they can find happiness in having a relationship that they think is predefined by some notion that they have and no matter what uh, that just never seems to fill that huge void in most people's soul and there is a overwhelming mass sort of a feeling especially in the United States that if you buy more things if you accumulate more, if you had that fancy car, you had that different car, you had that different house, you had the whatever it may be, that you'd be able to find some sort of level of happiness. And that is going to be what we discussed today. So thank you all for joining us and welcome back. Mr. Schmidt, how are you today? I am doing well. I would like to uh, go ahead and address that question, what is happiness? Because I think it gets more complex than just what is happiness. I think it goes to what your circumstances are in life, how old you are, how young you are, what you have achieved and what you haven't achieved. Because I've thought on many occasions at different points in my life that that would make me happy or this would make me happy or doing a certain event. And I've realized that I think that there can be a melding of everything. Because like you said, keeping up with the Joneses, is that going to make you happy buying the next material thing? I think that is a carefully cultivated Americanism that is now went worldwide that you're trying to keep up with the Joneses and you need that next thing. But that's just being forced down your throat through advertisement and everything else. I don't think material things can make anyone happy. I think that attachment you get is just filling some void or hole that is there really something deeper? I think basically what I think happiness is, and I think most people, is the need to be needed. That people want to have those relationships where they can rely on somebody else. There's that give and take, whether that be with a kid or your siblings or your mother, your father, your grandparents. I think for me, at least at this point in my life, I think that need to be needed is a very important quality. I think you are absolutely right. I think you hit it pretty much right on the head. Um, it's a difficult proposition because as you age, you know, of course, I'm in the middle of my life, I hope, being 48 and with a whole string of accomplishment behind me and a larger string of failures behind me. It is, I look back on some of the things that I've done with quite amazement and it gives me a level of happiness. But that's not all encompassing. You know, it's just like, I always refer to this and have since I was young, whenever I started reading the Declaration of Independence on every 4th of July. It is, uh, it is the pursuit of happiness. And Thomas Jefferson had it absolutely right. Smart guy, that TJ. He, um, all we can ever do, I think, is pursue happiness. I think people get confused with levels of contentment. Like, I, I'm content with this. I'm pleasurably contented. I don't know if, if humans can be fully happy. Because you might be happy in one aspect of your life. Maybe you have a a great relationship with your spouse. But then on the other hand, maybe you have a poor relationship with a parent that brings you displeasure and it doesn't allow the full you to be happy. Maybe you have uh, some, maybe you have a child that is just a complete reprobate, you know I mean, a drug head, you can't solve his drug problem or, I mean, there's a whole host of things uh, that can, dampen your happiness. So the whole idea when I hear people, I just want to be happy. I just wish I could be happy. Well, happiness can only be a state of mind. The only way you can even remotely 
find a level of comfort within yourself is to rely only on yourself and not so much on relying on how other people make you feel because nobody makes you feel anyway you make yourself feel that way i think you said something very important there i think that the thought of a human making themselves either happy sad or indifferent is something that gets overlooked that nothing is going to really make you happy unless you want it to make you happy i think there's steps that you can take to build upon your own happiness but you have to take those steps. It has to be you putting those things out. Like I said, the need to be needed, you have to put yourself out in those situations to be needed. You've got to make the effort or it all is for naught. You have to depend and rely on yourself. But there is some other, other human contact that goes along there. And I think another point of being happy is to realize that it is not important if, if everybody likes you. Like like us, we come with a uh, warning <laughs> label most of the times when we are introduced to new people because we really don't care if you like us or not because we're going to be us. And we think that's the truest form of anything is just to be yourself. If you're a little weird like we are, who cares? I mean, we pursue our happiness in a lot of different ways. And right. also, I like what you said is the pursuit of happiness because I don't think in this life you're going to be completely and utterly happy you're going to just pursue it. And like you said, you look back on your life, your past gives you great joy. And some people's it may not. And I think another thing that gets overlooked in this thing we call life is the only thing we really have are memories. The entirety of life is made up of memories. If you think about it, the past is nothing. Or the present is nothing. Sorry, the past is everything. Because right now, Two seconds ago, that's the past. Well, we are the sum total. Some people, philosophers, disagree with this to some levels, but we are the sum total of our past. Our experiences dictate certain emotions because we haven't conquered ourselves yet. We haven't reached that, that whole level of enlightenment that if someone else might be mad at us, we don't let it affect our inner peace. I certainly have not attained that level of enlightenment I know just as water changes its molecular structure with uh, being around ill intent is, and that's just scientific proof for all of you people that uh, don't know water has feelings. It certainly does. And it's the same way with people. If someone comes into the room right now with a very bad attitude and it's somebody that we know or maybe care about, well, it's going to affect us in some way that's going to make us somewhat this pleasurable. We're not going to find that peak level of happiness when somebody comes in the room sad, mad, you know, upset about whatever thing. And every every instance in life, whether it is between uh, anyone, whether it's me and my spouse, me and you, uh, we have, for those of you watching, we have uh, two people in the room with us, my wife and uh, Parker here, who's my main man. You know, what, what if there was a uh, is I think kids illustrate the point perfectly because they haven't had, most kids in the United States are not taught how to look within yourself, how to find your inner peace, how to be still, how to, how to be still and think. And I think definitely in today's time, that's a big problem because I have fallen victim to this, that in today's world, it is almost impossible to be bored. You have a constant source of entertainment at your fingertips, always, 24-7. And I think that can be dangerous because you don't ever look outside or inside for any kind of peace, happiness, or anything. You just rely on these big tech companies to give you your happiness and peace. And I think that's a mistake. It was kind of like the same thing or the same sort of thought process we were talking about, can love be harmful, in one of our last videos, that too much love can be devastating. And then you say, um, with entertainment, no, not being bored. Well, sure, it's the same principle. We can't be bored because everybody has their phone, some sort of device. They can find whatever entertainment. If people, and you know, most people do not use those devices for their self-betterment. They're not looking for different ways 
to improve themselves or to learn something. They're using it to watch ignorance, sports, nonstop. Whether, you know, you gotta have bread and circuses. You, you have to in this country and, and all over the world because nobody in the power structure of the world wants anyone to be enlightened and don't want anybody to think. So if I upset you by doing some sort of action and disturb your happiness, well, I think you said we were weird. And I think people, um, I think if you're not like a little weird, not necessarily like us, but if you're not a little weird where you don't, where you, and what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say. I think that, you're trying to say is normality is the greatest curse to ever strike humanity ever. It well, is okay to be strange and odd. And if you stick out a little bit or you think you stick out a bit, you should remember that everyone is a little weird in their own ways. And I think you should embrace those things that make you different and not want to fit into the herd. I think you'll find much, a, a much better quality of happiness if you're not trying to please everyone else and fit into what you think is the mold for society. It's okay to stand out. Well, you're, you're right in that aspect. But in the, I think the highest level of happiness or attainment of that that we can achieve is no matter what I was, what I was getting at is if, if we upset each other somehow for whatever reason, we are weird enough that we will think about it. We'll think, okay, that was, in retrospect, I think I did something wrong or in retrospect, you did something wrong. And that we are men, and big enough men, that we'd say, hey, I, I really apolog I'm apologetic that that happened, and I'm not going to do that again, whatever it is. And when you have those type of relationships, it's really easy to find happiness. Like, I, I feel extremely fortunate uh, with my wife. It's the only relationship I've ever had where I haven't really, you know, well, I haven't had to try with you either, so... Uh, you and my spouse are, are are pretty fortunate for me that I don't have to try. It's not I'm just like, oh God, I wonder what I'm going to do wrong today to make somebody mad. I wonder how this is going to be. I'm just I'm me, and y'all seem to like me unless y'all are really good liars. <laughs> <laughs> and with everybody else outside of that. Um, you know, we have brothers, we have uh, other people in our lives that are close to us, and those sometimes can feel like a challenge. I would definitely agree with you. Some of those other relationships can definitely be challenging. Yeah, and then so is it, and if there's, if there's some people that you just don't want to be around because maybe it's not so much you think differently, you just have a... Uh, you're striving for a higher level of understanding the world, yourself, and everything around you and attain some levels of comfort, not necessarily achieving more material possession, but levels of comfort that allow you to have a certain measure of freedom. In most cases, and including my own, that makes me feel better. I don't know if it's happiness, but it makes me feel better that the more I do, the more risk I take, the more things, the more comforts and freedoms I can allow myself and the people that I care about. Well, I think there's a difference there too between comforts and materialism. For example, as I get a little bit older, I realize that it is very important to have a really nice mattress and a really nice pair of shoes because you spend one third of your life on your mattress and the rest of your life are in your shoes. So those are important places to be comfortable. And I don't think that's is anyway could be construed as materialism because you need those some comforts in your life just to make your life better. Sure. Yeah. Well, you need a nice AC too in certain parts of the world. <laughs> it, it sure does make it nice. I always look back sometimes and think, you know, John D. Rockefeller was extremely rich, but even the most modest people in today's America have almost everything that he had. 
I mean, if he wanted to listen to music at two o'clock in the morning, you know, he could have a band brought in and play or Napoleon or any of those guys. They could have somebody come in and play, but it would have been quite a challenge today if I want I just roll over and press a button on my little square device and boom, music, boom, books read to me, whatever. Well, that's true. The, our devices now are like little mini servants, if you will, because if you, instead of having someone wake you up, you have an alarm clock. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to go to the play, you can watch the play on your big screen or your device or whatever it may be. We have a lot of servants that people don't realize that they're servants. I mean, I think a lot of people don't think about things like that and they wish for more of these material things and they don't realize that they're already vastly more wealthy than 99.999% of the world's inhabitants have ever been. Well, that's true. You can, And I think of that often whenever I go into uh, the more poverty-stricken areas of Shreveport. We, we happen to live near Shreveport, Louisiana, and... You, know, you can go into some of these homes and you know they have air conditioning you didn't have air conditioning 100 years ago you didn't have uh, a lot of people did not have running water you did not have inside toilets inside toilets it, even i mean except for rare rare occasions uh, most people just didn't have them and so you know when you start to think you know oh, life is so bad life stresses me out Maybe the things that should stress you out are, well, am I going to eat today? Am I a, a, am I shoveling for diamonds nonstop in, in Africa and I don't have a choice or I'm going to get killed? That may stress you out. See, I'm glad you brought up that point because I have seen and heard people talk about, oh, they're poor, they're broke. And I've thought to myself, y'all have no idea what poverty is being in America. I mean, the average income worldwide still today is about two U.S. dollars. I mean, two U.S. dollars. And any job in America makes more than two dollars an hour. So you're making more than two dollars an hour when most people don't make that in a day. They think, oh, well, I'm so poor. I have this house and this car that doesn't really work half the time. Well, we came back from India and on the outsides of some of these big cities are basically shanty towns where there's a five by five by six foot ten shed and there's ten to twelve people living there and they're always smiling and happy. It's always. They're right. happy, happy, happy. India is the happiest country I've ever been to. They're yeah. just happy. They're, they're the poorest, the poor. They barely eat and they are just happy. Now in the United States, we're a lot different and that's because we're brainwashed by society with all the materialism every i mean people don't realize it but you're getting hit with you know thousands of ads all, all, ads all, 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 all the time and now it's even worse because your devices have custom tailored ads to fit you and basically only you that's the, that's exactly right and it's hard to even know what your own happiness is when most people don't even realize that their own thoughts are not even theirs i would say that 99 percent of people have and will never actually have an original thought. Well, that's, that's a fact. And I don't know if that stems from the, the massive amount of depression in the United States. I mean, we're the most drug country in the world, and you would think that all these drugs would make everybody happy. Everybody would just be walking around smiling, loving their brother and sister, and, hey, how y'all doing? You don't even need drugs anymore. I mean, you pick up this device, and you turn on the screen, that blue light affects your brain in negative ways. And you have all these dopamine hits that anytime you get a like or this or that. And one thing that I have noticed, and I've tried this myself, is once a week, and I'm, I'm not a big cell phone user really, honestly, but once a week, I completely turn off everything. I don't answer the phone unless it's a call and it's a must answer. I don't look on any kind of social media. I don't do anything screen related. And it's... What it is, is it's a dopamine detox because our brains are not used to having this amount of dopamine in them. We're used to having somewhere down here from evolution and it fluctuates small amounts. But in the 21st century, our dopamine meters are way up here. I mean, you got to bring yourself down and that'll bring you a increased amount of happiness just on that. And that goes back to basically self-control. 
controlling what you do with your body and yourself because you, yourself, your person has to make that choice. Well, you, you make an interesting, yeah, that was a, a part of happiness that I wasn't going to, I didn't think I would, we'd be talking about or touching on today. When you talk about the different levels of, of hormones and different chemicals that are released in the body through different actions, well, the body in, in the past 25, 30 years is experiencing things that no other human in millions of years or however long the humans have been here, no one knows. And we have Wi-Fi everywhere going straight through us, which causes adverse effects. That's just proven. We have cell phone networks. Cell phone networks everywhere. Now we have the uh, RF devices uh, on your smart meters reading your electricity. We have uh, radio the radio waves. waves. Yeah, TV. I mean, it's just nonstop. We're getting bombarded and changing our molecular structure, which causes an adverse effect on everyone. And you only have about approximately 5% of the people that, that have visible adverse effects to it. So who knows what the long-term implications of any of that are. And even to make it worse, we're such a society that's dependent on pharmaceutical drugs that it cannot be washed out of the system. So we, people take all these pills, it goes down into the sewer, it gets uh, the, they clean the water, and then it gets fed back. We're mass medicating everybody in the entire country practically. And there's so many other things outside of just finding your inner peace and trying to let things just wash over you and not affect you. Some things you just can't avoid without a very strong cognizant effort and even then you cannot avoid it all well there are ways to avoid it you could build yourself a little copper screen room i mean you you could <laughs> we're getting a little out there but what you talked about on mass medicating the populace uh, that's one thing i did want to touch on is no matter what medication you do or don't take you're getting high quantities because it's in your tap water if you're on any kind of municipal water, you're fed chlorine, fluoride, all kinds of other cleaning things that you may or may not know, depending on what your city is. They have different things. Then you have the advent of female birth control that gets into the water stream. All these antidepressants, other a lot, the oh, yeah. other illicit drugs are all through the. They're Everything. coming into your body, and you have to make a really hard, conscious effort not to take those in. You need really expensive water source systems and reverse osmosis and all these things to get that out of your body that most people don't even realize they're taking it in and it can adversely affect your happiness and you can think you're doing everything right yeah. and you're having some kind of chemical imbalance fed into you. Yeah, and you think of this new generation that's popped up that, you know, heck, they're anywhere from 15 to early 30s well, heck, most of those people are just in a in a whole fake sort of world. You know, the world revolves around what are they what are they doing on social media? What are their all these different effects? And everybody making this image of their life is so grand, and everybody feels like their life is not so grand, which causes a whole other state of of depression. And then they have to feed, or they have to absorb. All these things that we didn't have to as well at least me and my wife and people my age and older you know there were it wasn't this mass infiltration of radio waves and rf and, and i mean all these horrible things that, that you can't escape and the water system we didn't have these this kind of mass pharmaceutical invasion of our water system and i mean that's a recent phenomenon of the past 30 40 years really for everyone. Well, not only the mass invasion of that going into the water, but just plastics going into the water. I mean, if you look at the sperm count of men that are in their 50s to men in their 30s and 20s, it's almost the same. I mean, every generation sperm count for men and testosterone levels keep going down. And science says now that plastics are a big part of that. Yeah, plastic is very bad. Yeah, plastics are bad. But I'd like to go back to what you were talking about, other kids on social media. Last night, my wife and I went out to eat, and across the table there was a booth, and there were six young guys, probably between 18 to 21. 
and they're all sitting there in this restaurant, and there's probably a hundred TVs in this restaurant. <laughs> I mean, they're everywhere. TVs all over the place. But all these kids are sitting there on their smartphones just scrolling away while there's hundreds of TVs around them and they're in a crowded bar with their friends. They're still on their phones. Yeah, there's no conversation. These kids... Yeah. And even when the conversation does arise, the conversation is about something that's on their device. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think... For me, that's not living. That's not the life that I want to live. That doesn't strike me as any kind of happiness. Well, what, we're, what we have done systematically, and I believe uh, mostly on purpose, is we have prevented this generation from zero to about 30. They have almost no social skills. You can't go sit with them and have a conversation at dinner. You can't sit and talk about any subject because they don't know anything except the most mundane foolish it's just it's it's hideous it's horrible it's so i'd like to know why where and what those people think what love is and where does love come from or what do they even have a concept of it no they have a concept of what they've seen in the uh the movies that they watch and that's it and if their love affair doesn't mimic some sort of uh, love affair that they think, you know, that's been implanted into their brain by what they surround themselves with, then they find themselves in a state of high anxiety. They find themselves in a state of misery. I think that could be true of not just this generation, but I think yeah, a lot of generations can be guilty of that, of avid readers. I mean, there's... Romance novels have always sold them done really <laughs> well. I mean, oh well, yeah, for ages, for hundreds of years. Yeah, and if you're a young woman or a young man reading these things, they don't realize that first off, these are fictional characters that live in a fictional world and fictional universe. Don't tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, these these points and phases are all brought up and carefully schemed out by one person's mind. The plot can never really go awry. Things really don't happen like that. The world doesn't work like that. It's not carefully main round, mainlined and streamed by one divine entity that ends up in a romance novel. And no man is perfect, and no woman is perfect. Come on now. It has to be one out there. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's not. And I think that's another danger with these romance things is, is people get this dissociative identity thing where they think of themselves as a hero in their own narrative and they don't realize that they're not always the hero, that they do just as much wrong or even more than the villain of the character or the story. Oh, for sure. Everybody thinks they're a hero in their own mind. Even if they don't see themselves as some grandiose character, they still see themselves as the, you know, the great person. Yeah. And just, it kind of goes back to, you know, when does love become harmful? <laughs> it's the same thing. I'm, I'm just a loving, nice, sweet person. And, that can cause an infinite amount of harm. But, you know, it's neither here nor there. But uh, what we're talking about is happiness. And outside of all the pharmaceutical drugs that people are taking, just from their largest organ on their body, in their body, is your skin. So you're spending a lot of time in the bath. You spend a lot of time in the shower. Hopefully everyone is in the bath or the shower every day. and But maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> well, even if they're not in a bath or shower every day, they wash their clothes in these things, and you put your clothes on all day, and you wear it through the day, and you wear it at night in your sheets, so you're still having contact with these things. Well, outside of all that, and outside of all the outside influences that you really can't control except people, you can't control people, I'm talking about everything else except just people and, and us, we can train ourselves to step back and take a deep breath. And I'll steal something from Jefferson again, who I'm sure stole it from somebody else. You know, when you're upset, stop, pause, take a deep breath, just count to 10 before you say anything. And if you're really, really pissed off, count to 100. <laughs> you know what I mean? That is just really grand, great advice. But we can find a measure of happiness when we do take a deep breath. When we think somebody made a mistake or somebody harmed us or we did something wrong or whatever it is, we do have to realize that we are, there is a duality within us. We are good and we are bad. And we have to embrace 
all of who we are and all of everybody that we love. And we have to recognize that we are that duality and we have to roll with that. We have to spin, if you will, if you got the yin and the yang and just spun it around. I mean, that is what we have to do and not be so judgmental, not think that, oh, this is the end of the world because this happened. You know, oh gosh, I wasn't able to get my Starbucks today. I'm just really upset. You know, I didn't, I wasn't able to do this right now when I wanted to. Does that mean the world is coming to an end? Does that mean, does that mean I need to spend my energy on being in a bad mood when I could easily focus that energy on being in a good mood? Even if it's hard for that few moments. Yeah, I can go, all right, I can, I can pout and be blah. Or I can focus my thoughts on being happy and enjoying the things that I enjoy about everybody that I'm around and enjoy the things about myself. That is easier said than done, but it is, it becomes easier the older you get whenever you try to. Well, you have to have practice with some of these things. I, th I think you hit a really good point there is looking on the things that you should be thankful for, even when you're in a bad mood. Like here, it was just after Thanksgiving. And I was thinking about things and I was like, you know, there's a lot that you could be sad for. There's a lot that I want or this or that. But then how many times and how many things are you thankful? How many great luxuries do you have? How many times are you just like, man, that was really cool. I should step, I should stop and think about that more. Like one of the things that fascinates me, and I don't understand how people don't think this is just the most amazing thing ever, is you walk into any modern grocery store it's amazing. Like, it just makes me happy to think about. I mean, you can walk into a <laughs> store and you can get eggs from New York. You can get the sourdough bread from California. You can get wine from Chile or Europe, anywhere over there. You can get salmon from Alaska. You can get all these different things that are brought together in one little store. You can get your rice from China. It's amazing. And I, I look at things like that and I'm like, man. You, that just makes me happy. Like, I don't know why other people don't look at this and just be in awe and amazement. Well, most people never even think about it because, again, it goes back to that whole paradigm of the United States that we live in. We live in this instant happiness, instant happiness, and we never consider those things. Every shopping center, every grocery store, it's a modern marvel. It is the, yeah. it is the main bazaar on the Silk Road. I mean, it, it's it's even more than a main bazaar on the Silk Road because we have air conditioning and heating. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And there's no camels that are spitting in our face. Well, in that's, America anyway. That's right. But, you know, the, we have a lot to be happy for. We should focus on, and I'm very bad at doing this, but I've gotten much better. When I do get a small level of anxiety, I don't really get high anxiety anymore, but... You, know, you just focus on what you love, what you care about, what you enjoy, what you like to learn. What makes you grow as a person? When you start to focus on those things, instead of being in a, oh, blah, you're high anxiety, you feel like your life is uh, in the shambles or whatever. Most people have a, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the people have something to be thankful for that they're glad. You know, you lost one leg, be glad you didn't lose the other. You know, I mean, <laughs> there's just a lot to be thankful for in this world. I mean, you know, it really is a lot to be thankful for. The one thing I think about when I'm really down and getting kicked in the teeth and or I'm knocked back, you take that one step forward and you get those two steps thrown back. Sometimes I think of my life as almost like a sporting event. You know, the best football games or baseball games or whatever you like is your team is they're up and then they're down and they make that last second comeback to win. Well, you get to look at your life like that sometimes. Oh, this is that low point where I've got to rally back and it's going to make a really good, exciting story because I'm going to finish out on top. And I just look at that low point as I'm going to build back up to that high. I have to relish that low point because I know the highs are coming if you just keep trying. I mean like I've said in previous videos, is you can only see light in the presence of darkness. Well, that's a good analogy to have. And the thing that really helps me is because I've been a trader for 25 years and do it every day and have for decades, I know that whenever things go down, things are going to go back up. 
I know that is just the cycle of life. Everything goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And hopefully that up and down is just going like this for my life. And that's just the best you can do is recognize that not everything's going to be perfect every day, all day. You're going to have the ups, you're going to have the downs, and you have to roll with them. Because yeah, honestly, I wouldn't want it to be perfect every single day. I that know. would just be boring. I would love to drink perfect wine on the perfect porch in the perfect patio, patio area overlooking Florence or something. I think. Yeah, but then you'd get tired of that. You'd want something different. That's you'd true. That well, then you'd just have to go to Rome, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're you're building a, a business or you're trading or you're doing whatever you're doing, is really what really excites you and what really keeps you going is just that motivation to keep going. That's what a lot of people find joy in is you're that dog chasing a car because when you find the car, what do you, what do you do well, with it? You, you bought that thing or you, you bought this house or you bought this car that you always wanted and it's, well, you it was new and now it's not any good. You like that pursuit of happiness. Well, it goes to me is every successful person I've ever known always when you ask them about their life, how they get there, what they learn, they rarely talk about their main successes. It's always the failures. They always want to talk about the failures because that is what made them better people. They, that was their biggest learning experience. That was what they were most proud of is whenever they got over that failure, whenever they were at the bottom and figured out how to get back on top. And most people have that happen a kajillion times. Well, what separates is those people from successful and not successful is when they were at the low point, they didn't give up. They kept going. Because there's a lot of people that hit that low point and they're give done. up. Yeah, they're done. Well, it just boils down to we all have our own different methods. Some people have meditation. Some people have writing in a journal. Some people do both. Some people do yoga. Whatever it, whatever it is for the individual that can help you overcome your life's failures, your day-to-day -day anxiety, your day-to-day -day issue, yeah, that's what you should focus on. It's, it's not one size fits all. It's everybody has their own little way to make them feel better. You know, it's uh, Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP. There are a lot of different ways inside that that are just really fantastic on how to help you focus in on the better things that make you happier. You're never gonna have full happiness unless you're just a a perfect, you know, Buddhist monk and you're just found enlightenment. You know, that other than that, it's gonna be really tough. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be tough. So uh with that and our ongoing quest for happiness and and just happiness and love each other the best we can without being harmful. Just it's, a tricky, I mean, it's yeah. a tricky it's a tricky situation. And it's one that we work on and talk about on a regular basis. This is pretty a broad overview of some of our, our thoughts on that. So you have anything else you want to add before we cut this to an end? I don't think I'm good there. I just want to ask everybody out there to do what's best for you. Go out, experiment, do it and find what works for you. Nothing is a fit all. What works for us isn't gonna work for you. Just be yourself, go out there, have fun, and remember it never really gets that bad. And like us, share it if you have anybody that uh, likes these kind of uh, philosophical topics. And we're also on BitChute, DTube, Library, and I think there's another one, but I'll let you know. We're on all of them, including YouTube. Have a good day.